Amen. Thank you, musicians and choir. Thank you, church, for joining with us again tonight. So, this is going to be our last sermon uh, through our evening series on evangelism. And so hopefully this has been helpful and encouraging to you. And, and part of the reason I've, I've done it this way is to uh, kind of just encourage you and myself um, along the way and, and in anticipation for uh, the outreach this coming Saturday at 10 o'clock. So uh, let me urge you to, to come Saturday morning and just see what the Lord's going to do as we reach out in Jesus' name, and hopefully you picked up some tips and, and tools, and if nothing else, just confidence in the Lord that when we pray and when we step out in faith, uh, He He acts, um, so it's not dependent on us, but it's dependent on Him and His power. So tonight, uh, I'm just going to talk about uh, the evangelistic lifestyle. So how can we take what we have learned and, and, um, and maybe just try to forge it, uh, not, just, not just something we do occasionally, but as a way of life. So that's what I want to talk about, what I want to talk about tonight. Uh, and as we begin, let's pray together. Lord, we just confess our need of you, and Lord, uh, we desire to testify to your goodness, to testify to the gospel of grace, how sinners, Lord, can be reconciled to holy God, find forgiveness of sins and eternal life through Jesus Christ. And Lord, we just ask that in your kindness and in your mercy, day by day, week by week, Lord, that we would be sensitive to the leading of your Holy Spirit to speak, Lord, where we ought to speak and to just stop and say hello and get to know people and hear people's stories and tell them the difference that you have made in our life and the difference that you can make in theirs. Lord, we just want to be used by you so that other people might know the joy that we have and the hope that we have of everlasting life. So help us, we pray, lead us, we pray. And we ask these things in Jesus' name, amen. Well, so I'm going to be talking about the evangelistic lifestyle, and you know, when it comes to life and, you know, we think about lifestyle, um, for example, we all we all kind of know that we should probably eat better than we do, most of us, and exercise more than we do. And because why? Well, because you know, eating better and exercising are part of a healthy physical life. So, it's true uh, that evangelism is part of a healthy spiritual life. But just like as we all know, you don't walk into the gym by accident. Um, it requires a little, uh, a little discipline, a little intentionality, a little focus. But I'm told, if you do it enough, uh, it becomes second nature. It's just it just becomes part of your routine, your habit. You don't even think about it. Well, that's how we want our spiritual life to be. We want to wake up in the mornings and not even think about, am I going to read my Bible today? You just do it. Am I going to pray today? You just do it. Am I going to be a witness to Christ today? You just do it. We want it to be part of our lifestyle. You know, today, unfortunately, we live in a world that doesn't value intentionality and discipline as it should, or at least not in the areas where it's most important, but... Uh, and, and, and people view intentionality and discipline as enslaving, but the truth is, is uh, discipline, if you think about it, is actually freeing. So, for example, 
let's say that um, uh, that you're a violinist and uh, you want to make it big. You want to go to New York City and play in the orchestra. So what do you do? You practice and you practice and you practice and you discipline yourself and you deny yourself other things that you might want to do in order to practice. Why? Why do you spend so much time and intentionality practicing well, it's because it, it, it's so that when you pick up your violin, guess what? You can do whatever you want on that violin. If I, if I sat in front of that drum set, I would be at a total loss of what to do. But if you practice and practice uh, like Donnie does on drums, you can sit in front of that drum set, and guess what? You can make it do whatever you want. In other words, discipline and intentionality are actually freeing because it frees you Uh, it frees you to exercise that skill without even thinking about it. It just becomes part of who you are. And so we want to be such practiced Christians, as it were, that we don't even have to think about being holy or being generous or, or, or sharing our faith. It just flows out of us because, of course, we have first put it into practice. And so tonight I just want to share a, a few more tips about how we can make evangelism a part of our lifestyle. Uh, and the first tip is this. As we go about our lives and as we think about sharing the gospel with others, I think it's important that we make it our goal to make friends and not visits. Make friends and not visits. Listen to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 5-8. through 8. Paul writes, For we never came to you with words of flattery, as you know, nor with a pretext for greed, God is witness, nor did we seek glory from people, whether from you or from others, though we could have made demands as apostles of Christ, but we were gentle among you, like a nursing mother taking care of her own children. So, being affectionately desirous of you, We were ready to share with you not only the gospel of God, but also our own selves because you had become very dear to us. So think about what Paul's saying. He didn't come to the Thessalonians in order to flatter them. We're not trying to flatter people when we share the gospel, nor is a pretext for greed. We're not trying to get something out of them, I hope. We're not trying to just get another warm body in the pew. Uh, or they're not, Paul said we didn't seek glory from people. He's not, he's not just out there trying to be known as a great apostle because he got so many converts, so many notches in his evangelistic belt, so to speak. Rather, Paul came... To share the gospel with the Thessalonians, but not only the gospel, but he says, we were ready to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our own selves, because you had been, you have become very dear to us. So, you know, the temptation, of course, especially, you know, as we, you know, for example, we're thinking about, contemplating going out on, on this coming Saturday to share the gospel, and it could be tempting to, to to have the wrong view, the wrong attitude, I think, you know, just, um, like I said, just trying to get a bigger church, that that can be tempting. We have to remember, though, we have to intentionally go with the mindset to make friends and not visits. The the people outside these walls that we're going to talk to, they're people with eternal souls that need the gospel of grace. And we're going to have the opportunity to kind of step out in faith, knock on doors, and maybe they'll give us some time, and we can love them Uh, in the Lord Jesus Christ, then we can seek to get to know them. And insofar as they're willing to talk to us, we can try to get to know their story and we can tell them our stories. And um, and Lord willing, we can see lives changed by the power of the gospel and the Holy Spirit. It's not complicated. We don't have to overthink it. You just got to love people. And, um, and, uh, one method that uh, Alvin Reed shares in, in his book, uh, just kind of another tool in your tool bag, so to speak, 
Uh, and we, we sang a great song this morning about how we are storytellers of the gospel. And he says, you know, here's one thing that you can do. Just try to hear people's story. It just tells them that you care. And then you can empathize with their story. Usually, most of, most of the time, our experiences are not so far apart that we can't empathize with other people's stories and, and see ourselves in some small way in their story. And then he says... After we hear their story and empathize with their story, we can retell their story back to them redemptively. So let me give you an example. Let's say you talk to someone and they say, well, you know, we're going through a hard time. You know, there's lots of health problems in our family and things like that. You can empathize with them. You can pray for them. You can show your concern for them. You can share about a heart a difficult season in your life when someone in your family struggled with health problems. And then you could retell their story redemptively. That is, you can say, you can say, uh, you can just tell them, you know, in this circumstance, in this situation, with all the difficulty you're going through, with the Lord Jesus Christ in your life, he can redeem this, he can use this, he can strengthen you, he can teach you to know him through the circumstances, through this this, this difficulty, you can retell their story back to them in a redemptive way to show them how God can and is indeed using their story to point them to himself. And so, uh, make friends and not visits. And so that's just true in all of life, not just this Saturday, but, but as we out and about in life, Take time and try to get to know people. Now, another thing that's going to happen as we go about and, and are just talking about our faith, talking about Christ and getting to know other people, is that people are going to have questions. And we haven't talked about this much, but, and maybe, um, you know, uh, at some point, Lord willing, I'll, maybe I'll do a series on some apologetics, and that is some answers to questions that people have about things. But here's the thing when you encounter questions. Um, you know, because people sometimes will ask you hard questions. You know, the hardest questions to answer are usually very personal questions about, you know, why did God allow this to happen to me and things like that. Try to answer the questions as best as you can. If you don't know, don't make something up. <laughs> Just say, I'll get back with you. All right? And get back to them when you say that. Most questions that people have are really not the real reason for their unbelief. Um, you're, you're not going, you know, let's say you're, you, you know, you've read all the books and, you know, you're a, you're a sharp Christian apologist. Well, give it, giving somebody a philosophical smackdown isn't going to win them to Christ. And so, look, you just got to love them and, um, and answer their questions as best you can. And again, like I said, most of the time, most, most of the time, and not, not all the time, but most of the time, question, the questions they have are not the real reason for unbelief. You know, Stephen Hawking this week passed away. A brilliant scientist made incredible contributions. But, of course, uh, he had an entire diff, a different interpretation of the evidence that, that, that we have. And, um, uh, and he was, you know, pretty well known to be an atheist. Uh, Stephen Hawking one time said... Religion is a fairy tale for people who are afraid of the dark. Uh, but John Lennox, uh, an apologist and professor at Oxford University, said, um, atheism is a fairy tale for people afraid of the light. And, um, and, uh, but he, and what, is, what does John Lennox mean by that? He means what, what, John, mean, what John meant in John chapter 3 is that uh, the reason why people don't come to the light is not because they don't have the light, it's because they love the darkness. But what we want to do is to present the light to people as best we can so that they can see its beauty. You see? We want to sh- the light is painful to people because it exposes your sin. People, the reason why people don't come to church is because they don't want their lives to change. What they, but the thing is, is that they can't see because they're blinded by their sin, that their sin is destroying them. And so God, in calling out their sin, is not trying to hurt them. He's trying to help them, but they can't see it. And so what we've got to do is try to display the light 
as beautifully as possible to them with our words and with our deeds. And so what do we do when you encounter people with questions? Well, the biggest thing, like I said, is to answer it the best you can, get back to them. But the most important thing is to just focus on the gospel. Just focus on the gospel. Apologetics are not the power of God to salvation. The gospel is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, the Jew first and also the Greek. So get to the gospel. Make sure that you explain that we live in a world broken by sin, that our own lives are broken by sin because we look up to heaven and say, not thy will be done, but my will be done. And because we do that, we're sinners by nature and by choice. Because we're in rebellion against God, we're under his just condemnation. But God in his mercy 2,000 years ago sent a man named Jesus Christ to pay the penalty for our sins. He rose from the dead conquering the penalty for sin. And so now if we will turn from our sin and believe in him, he will change us and remake us and help us to live the way he designed us to live with a meaning and purpose for his glory. Get to the gospel. And of course, you, you should continue to build relationships. You know, sometimes when you talk to people, you'll never see them again. But oftentimes, you'll have the opportunity to build a relationship with them. Do whatever you can to try to do that and nurture that relationship. Because the relationship is the context in where, in where you get to physically show what you are verbally saying. You get to put the gospel on display. So we must proclaim the gospel verbally. However, in the context of relationships is where we get to adorn that gospel physically. And it oftentimes gives it weight and power. And, of course, in in Alvin Reed, in his book, he makes this um, illustration that I think is pretty helpful. He says that there is a scale, so to speak, between verbal witness and physical witness, so to speak, or or loving them and, and serving them. He says, the more intimate your relationship is with a person, the less verbal and the more showing the gospel uh, you should do. And, this is, what, and this, is what, this is what he meant by that. He doesn't mean that you shouldn't, you should stop continuing to share the gospel. But what he means is, for example, if you have a relationship with someone and you shared the gospel with them and they haven't shown interest, well, if Every time you meet them, you bring it up and beat them over the head with it. You're not helping. So there must be a scale, so to speak, to where the more intimate that relationship is, you're going to back off verbally some and show more physically. You're going to serve them more. You're going to show it more in the hopes that the visible witness will soften their heart to your verbal witness because by that point, they already know where you stand and where you desire them to be. Um, so the more intimately you know someone, the more you should live it out. And uh, we do, there, there, and there is biblical support for this idea. Um, if you have a very, very deep relationship, for example, with a spouse, um, you're not going to nag your spouse to heaven. It's just not going to happen. So in that case, um, your life becomes more powerful than anything. And, and Peter actually speaks to this in 1 Peter chapter 3. He says, Wives, be subject to your own husbands, so that even if some do not obey the word, they may be won without a word by the conduct of their wives. When they see your respectful and pure conduct, do not let your adorning be external, the braiding of the hair and the putting on of gold jewelry or the clothing you wear, but let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which in God's sight is very precious. I want, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read this to you. It's a, story from, it's a story that Charles Spurgeon told one time that st- powerfully illustrates this point. This is the story. A husband who was a depraved man of the world had a wife who for many years bore with his ridicule and unkindness, praying for him day and night 
though no change came over him except that he grew even bolder in his sin. One night, being at a drunken feast with a number of his cursing companions, he boasted that his wife would do anything he wished. She was as submissive as a lamb. Now, he said, she has gone to bed hours ago, but if I take you all to my house, at once she will get up and entertain you and make no complaint. Not she, they said, and the matter ended in a bet, and away they went. It was in the small hours of the night, but in a few minutes she was up and remarked that she was glad that she had two chickens ready. And if they would wait a little, she would soon have a supper spread for them. They waited, and before long, at that late hour, the table was spread, and she took her place at it as if it was quite an ordinary matter, acting the part of a hostess with cheerfulness. One of the company, touched in his better feelings, exclaimed, Madame, we ought to apologize to you for intruding upon you in this way and at such an hour. I am at a loss to understand how it is you receive us so cheerfully for being a religious person you cannot approve of our conduct. Her reply was, I and my husband were both formerly unconverted, but by the grace of God I am now a believer in the Lord Jesus. I have daily prayed for my husband, and I have done all that I can to bring him to a better mind. But as I see no change in him, I fear he will be lost forever. And I have made up my mind to make him as happy as I can while he is here. That's, that's powerful. They went away, and her husband said, Do you really think I shall be unhappy forever? I fear so, she said. I would to God that you would repent and seek forgiveness. That night, her patience accomplished her desire. He was soon found with her on the way to heaven. God's no fool. And as I talked about this morning, we have Christ's example of sacrifice to show us the way. Look. We live in a world today that basically says, you know, it it will read something like this and basically call it abuse. It basically call it ignorance. It basically call it, you know, uh, oppression. But look, Jesus willingly chose scorn, rejection, false accusation, false condemnation. Why? Why? Because it redeemed the world. People aren't redeemed because you demand your rights. People are redeemed because we deny ourselves in love for others. Only the power of the cross can make you live like this. No human, you can't, you can't do what this woman did. Not without the Holy Spirit of God working in you, changing you, empowering you, so that by the love of Christ, the Bible says, It is God's kindness that leads you to repentance. She won her husband because she loved him well. So we make friends and not visits. We answer people's questions as best we we have, but the most powerful thing that we have is our life of sacrifice. And service to others. So how can we make this a part of our lifestyle? You know, you go to the doctor. You know, he scolds you and he gives you a plan and says you need to do this, this, and this. You may or may not take his advice. Well, we need a plan. Um, and in the book, uh, Alvin Reed gives, uh, he says that what you need to do is you need to find the intersection of your giftedness, calling, And satisfaction, that is what brings you the deepest satisfaction. Your giftedness, calling, and satisfaction. So your gifts, of course, would be your spiritual gifts, but they would also be more than that. They would be your talents, your skills, and abilities. Your callings would be um, the things that you are passionate about, the certain arenas in which you feel like uh, you can exercise your gifts. And the deepest satisfaction is just is that thing which, which, which brings you the deepest joy in life. And so... Just to give you an example to illustrate what he's talking about. Let's say that you get deep satisfaction in, in helping people, uh, as specifically maybe just helping people in, in various times of need. 
Let's say that your gifts are kind of like discernment and you're good at kind of, you know, reading people and understanding uh, how people are and, and, you've, and, and you feel a calling to, to serve the needy. Well, uh, maybe you can be a counselor at the CLC because they need some more. <laughs> and you can witness to people who are in need, who come for need, who are, uh, need some help, and you get to tell them about the good news of Jesus. That's a way... That's an intersection of your gifts, your calling, and your passions. Let will give you another example. Let's say you really enjoy basketball, and you love working with young men, and you, you get deep satisfaction out of seeing people grow physically and spiritually strong. Well, then you could be a volunteer at the, 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 the rec center and a basketball coach for kids. You, the point is, is you can find something that fits you. Does that make sense? You have passions, you have gifts, you have skills, you have talents, you have abilities, you have callings, you have things that bring you deep satisfaction. And so we just have to think and, and say, where do these things meet and where is some place in the, in the community where I can apply these things and, and it's going to give you access to people who need Christ, who need the gospel. And that, that's it. That's your spot. That's your place. Um. And so that's one way that we can make evangelism our lifestyle. And so find that place. The next, you know, next we just we have to set realistic goals. Um, you know, just say I want I want to have a spiritual conversation with pers- uh, somebody once every two weeks or once every week, and just kind of set that as a, a goal, realistic goal, a spiritual conversation. It doesn't necessarily, you might not, every time you talk to someone, you might not get to share the complete gospel, but you can talk about your faith. You can ask them about their faith. You can have a spiritual, you could pray for somebody, you know. If someone has a need, you can stop right there where you are. If people, more people watching, the better. Don't worry about it. Just pray for them. You know, there are things, so, uh, so set a goal, you know, and, um, um, Oh, what's his name? The evangelist D.L. Moody. Uh, he 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 set a goal that uh, that he would he would he would share the gospel with at least one person every day. And there there are stories about he'd lay down at bed at night and, and hadn't shared the gospel with anyone, so he'd get out of bed and go out and find somebody. So I'm not saying you have to do that, but I'm saying you set, you set a goal and 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 stick to it. And and then next, assess that plan over time. And then finally, and most importantly. Pray daily for your witness. Um, you know, we got to bathe everything we do in prayer. And, and if you were here last Sunday night, I shared a story about an opportunity that I had uh, that, you know, was totally unplanned. A guy just broke, broke down in front of our house, ran out of gas, and I got to share the gospel with him. If you pray, the Lord will provide. If you pray, the Lord will answer. And so, you know, we, we oftentimes, we just put too much pressure on ourselves. Like, we got to do to do. Look, look, just... Calm down and just pray, and God will take care of it, and he'll provide you opportunities, and he'll, he'll, he'll kind of he'll nudge you by the Holy Spirit, and you just take advantage of those things, and, and when you do, the Lord, the, I'm, I know the Lord will give us conversations, and you'll walk away, and you'll say, wow, that God orchestrated that. God, that, that person, you know, oftentimes, I mean, it happens all the time. They'll say, man, I'm so glad you came and talked to me. I'm so glad you came and prayed for me. I'm so glad you... People are longing for that, for, some, for real conversation that matters. So much in life is superficial, so we have opportunity to talk about the most important thing that there is. And so hopefully this, um, uh, this, this series has been helpful for you. And, um, and I just urge you this week to continue to pray for Saturday and continue to pray for people uh, to invite uh, to our Easter services. We still have the cards on the vestibule out there that you can easily hand to, to people. Um, and let's see, let's see what the Lord does. I really feel like the Lord's going to work and he's going to move and, um, and we'll give him the praise for it. So we're going to sing a song of invitation.